Welcome to the next uh, broadcast of the GRASP webcast, The Experts Speak. My name is Doug Kress, and I'm the program coordinator of the Great Ape Survival Partnership, GRASP, the unique alliance of 104 national governments, research institutions, private companies, conservation organizations, and dedicated individuals committed to ensuring the long-term survival of great apes and their habitat in Africa and Asia. Coming to you from the GRASP headquarters at, in Nairobi, Kenya, in the United Nations uh, compound here in Kenya. And today we'll be talking about modern zoos and great ape conservation. It is an, an important topic. It has tremendous potential for the conservation of these, of these iconic species. There's a great deal of controversy rooted perhaps in the past that we can address today. It's particularly timely because one week ago the GRASP Executive Committee voted to add the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA, which represents the zoos in North America, United States primarily, but also Canada and some in Mexico, as its 104th member to the partnership. And this now brings the total partnership to approximately 10% zoos inside GRASP. That is a dramatic growth, a dramatic change. And when you're talking about an organization like AZA, it represents 229 zoos in North America, you bring a great deal of expertise and opportunity to the table. Now, AZA joins a partnership that already has the World Association of Zoos and the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, IAZA. So three of the largest zoo associations are now partners inside GRASP, in addition to a number of individual zoos in the United States and in Europe. I'd like to now turn to introduce our panel for discussion today by Steve Unwin, a veterinary officer at the Chester Zoo. And Chester Zoo is one of the original partners that formed GRASP. We're also joined by Neil Madison, the head of conservation programs for the Bristol Zoo Society in the UK. We're joined by Chris Draper, who's the program manager for Captive Wild Animals and Science for the Born Free Foundation. We are joined also by Sharon Redrobe, the chief executive of the Twycross Zoo in the UK and also by Deborah Luke, the Senior Vice President for Conservation and Science for the AZA. Thanks everybody for joining us today and taking time to discuss this topic. Zoos around the world attract over 700 million visitors each year. That's a significant population. There are countries that, uh, there are entire regions and continents that don't have populations that large. So this is quite a, an estimable number. And the potential for Benefiting conservation, particularly great apes, is uh, is there. Yet there's always an issue with zoos. And if I could, I'd like to just turn to start with, with Chris Draper at the Born Free Foundation. Chris Born Free is a, a charter partner of GRASP and has been with us from the very beginning. And Born Free's foundation, really, and its roots are were built in trying to offer an alternative to zoos and to the captive issues surrounding uh, wild animals. Is that true? Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Doug. Uh, yeah, You've sort of very much, thrown me to the lions a little bit on this, but uh, happy to go first. And um, the question you ask about uh, the role of zoos in the, in the topic we're discussing here is that um, the way I see it, that you, you, you've you used a very key word when you said the potential for zoos uh, to, to be more involved in conservation. And, and this is a phrase I'm hearing a great deal in, in recent uh, years, th this discussion about the potential for zoos in conservation. And I have to say that, for the most part, it is still a discussion about potential. And I think it is likely to remain a discussion about potential rather than turning it into, in, it, rather than any sort of reality. Um, I th it, it's, an, it's an attractive prospect that this massive number of visitors that you've, you've made reference to are going to be going to zoos and leaving as confirmed uh, conservationists, um, particularly great ape conservationists, but I don't think the evidence really stacks up in support of that uh, position. Zoos do, you know, again, the, the, other, the other flip side of things that I hear from the zoo industry is that zoos in some cases are providing funding for, for great ape conservation. And I think that that is undeniable that there is some funding going from the more reputable zoos, uh, the accredited zoos, to some projects. Um, I guess the question I have then is, is it why is that funding such a small proportion of the zoo's income? Um, and what, you know, it Im implies to me quite strongly that that conservation funding isn't really the main mandate for a zoo, and the main mandate is exactly as you said, is to be a visitor attraction. Um, I know this isn't a particularly uh, popular 
position I'm taking on the issue, but I can only really say what I see here. That's, that's an important distinction to make, Chris. I, I think it's important that we all are clear that there are perhaps good zoos and bad zoos. There are progressive zoos and perhaps less progressive zoos. Uh, is there a reason that a zoo can't be both? It can't have one foot in commerce and be a visitor attraction or an educational opportunity and also be um, a conservation body. I think the, the evidence, as I understand it, is that that seems, again, like an attractive prospect, but it isn't being played out. Perhaps with you know a tiny number of ex exceptions, zoos are primarily remaining, I, I don't want to say commercial, because of course there are many non-profit uh, zoos, and I think some of the, some of the people on this uh, webcast today represent non-profit zoos. But at the end of the day, the facilities are visitor attractions, and yes, there may be some potential for education, for conservation messaging to to reach these people. But that's not why people are going to zoos, and it's not why zoos existed in the first place. And I do think it's, you know, again, an, an objective analysis would say that zoos are finding it a hard battle to put, a, put aside the hangovers of the past and actually put their money where their mouth is and become genuine conservation NGOs that that's, they so often claim to be. And I would throw you know, the question out there that surely the most efficient method of being a conservation NGO is to be just that, just be a conservation NGO. Raise money through the other traditional me means of uh, fundraising. You can give a gr far greater return on an investment as a, a, an organization that doesn't operate as a, as, a, as a zoo, as a visitor attraction, I believe, uh, then you can, um, you know, basically, you, you, can, you can do a far greater job being a non-profit NGO in its truest sense. And I'm, I do, uh, my position seems, you know, I, I get this strong feeling that zoos are struggling to make that transition despite claiming to have all the attributes of conservation NGOs at the moment. Thanks, Chris. Well, let me turn to, to Neil Madison at the Bristol Zoo Society now. Neil, you have been with GRASP since the beginning, as other zoos have as well, uh, and your zoo recently uh, spent about a million pounds, I believe, on a redevelopment for the gorilla enclosures there in Bristol. But is there any reason that a, a zoo can't operate in both worlds and be a conservation body as it also informs and or attracts the public? Well, well thanks, Doug. Um... I mean, I, I think that um, there are some very good points made um, about zoos finding their way as conservation organizations. I think we're still relatively, still relatively new. I mean, it's interesting because we did um, build a new gorilla exhibit, and on the back of that, we we had a connected fundraising campaign where we had a gorillas out in in the centre of Bristol. These um, these moles of wild art gorillas. And a big, a big fundraising push behind that. We raised half a million pound for gorilla conservation. That, that's in in a while. Um, so this vehicle, you know, of a zoo which has got huge overheads, um, and is, we're finding our way in what the best way is to use this as a resource. And there's lots of different ways that it can be used. I mean. The reality is that the world doesn't need another NGO working on gorillas per se in terms of you know the, the, the normal model we're talking about. It, it needs new thinking, new creativity because we're struggling. All of us are struggling to save these things that the numbers are declining in the wild. So everybody has to come together who's working in a particular way. And I don't mind if it is by bringing kids out and bringing their families to change their behavior, either in, in the UK or Europe or America or in Africa or in Asia. Um, or it can be, you know, we've got vets sitting around the table in this discussion who actually go out and do stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, saving these things, individuals, from, from dying. And that's the big contribution also to conservation. I spend an awful lot of my time in on gorilla conservation, and it, it's a battle. There's no question at all. It's it's not getting any easier. Um, we have to increase the, the 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 publicity, all of which as zoos we do. I mean, we we, we get a lot a lot of money, uh, a lot of attention in terms of the media, and we can build on that. But I think it is fair to say that we're still in the process of learning where the best use of our uh, of our support is. I mean, I get a lot involved in, in social change, you know, and that's what we, as zoos, what we do. We are agents for social change. We do that at zoos here. That's what we, we, we try and achieve. 
and taking that expertise and using it with local communities who are actually living around uh, protected areas where, where gorillas and, and chimps and orangs live. Um, so I would say yes, I, I, I understand that there is far more that zoos can do and also I think it's pretty well underestimated what we currently do and and I think we should perhaps you know look to how we can explain better how we're, 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 the investment we're making but we're, we're a key partner as, as, as you know yourself you know we've we put an awful lot of work and time and effort into trying to save these fantastic animals from extinction look the, the fundraising that was undertaken the exhibit I'm just curious in your opinion could you possibly have raised that much money if you were not a zoo if you were simply an NGO could you have raised that much uh, on a simple campaign I, I, mean, I doubt, not only do I doubt, I mean if you take Howlett's who raise an awful lot of money for their reintroduction programs in uh, in Gabon and, and Congo, they put a huge amount of effort into that. What we did was we tried a new technique, you know, of engaging people who wouldn't normally give to conservation funding and it, because it was, it was like a, a just creative and I, I know that grass is also very good at developing new creative ways to raise profile and money and this is what we did, you know, by getting these these ceramic gorillas out and having an auction on them, we raised huge amounts of money that there's no way we could have raised as, um, through the traditional fundraising means. So, yeah, we, we bring a different audience to the table, I think. Well, that's one thing that I think most zoos would agree on is that they have the ability to reach an audience, uh, not necessarily dyed in the wool conservationists, but an audience that perhaps could be converted into conservation. If I could turn now to uh, Shan Redrobe at the Twycross Zoo. You're one of those individuals Neil was just referencing. You spend time every year uh, in, in the bush in Cameroon helping out with uh, uh, great ape sanctuaries and primate sanctuaries. You do an awful lot of training. You have cardiac programs as well uh, for heart health for apes. Does the conservation value of zoos come down to the individuals or can it really be checkbook conservation? That's a, a really good question and I think um, we're digging a hole if we say the role of zoos is to give money to another project. I, I would find it hard to justify keeping and maintaining these wild and endangered animals just as a, a revenue source um, or a fundraising tool. Um, I think as the other speakers have already said, we just wouldn't be that efficient at that. There are much better ways of raising money um, and that's not for me, that's not what these animals are for. Yeah, I do have a foot in Cameroon. I just came back last week with Ape Action Africa. And it's a scary world out there. Um, and there are many animals, uh, chimpanzees and gorillas, in sanctuaries in country. And we can't yet release them because the wild is actually shrinking and becoming more unsafe in the last 15, 20 years, not, not actually safer and bigger. So, um, the simple, the simple fact is, you know, zoos exist. We have very full wildlife sanctuaries in country. There's not a simple answer to shut zoos and release them to the wild. I think we'd be putting animals in danger doing that. Is the role of zoos to fundraise? I, I am with you on that. There are more efficient ways of fundraising, much bigger amounts of money. I think what we have to be aware of is that, that we're keeping the animals on the planet. And I know some people are uncomfortable would say that sort of keeping and breeding animals in zoos um, is not is not ideal, but it can be a lot better than it has been in the past, and it is improving uh, very much. So I think you know at Twycross Zoo, I'm proud of the work we're doing. I can't speak for everybody else, but I think the fact that within the EASA population, the European Zoo population, we're managing the great apes. For genetically for the next 100 years, we have a sustainable population of, albeit only one species of gorilla, western lowland, only a couple of chimp um, and the bonobos and the orangs, but we've got some of them um, and that, that population will be self-sustaining and as outbred as the wild population for 100 years. And very tragically, you cannot say that for the current wild population. Um, and I know some people say they'd rather go extinct only exist rather than not go extinct, period. I'd rather the human race woke up and we decided to protect the wild population and that was safe. But, you know, I'm not in control of the entire world, but I'm in control of what we're doing at Twycross Zoo and the work we do with, with RASP and APAC in Africa, and I do think we're making a difference. You're in an interesting position. You're, you're 
part of the European Association of Zoos and Aquarius ape tag that looks very forward. You're talking about incredibly uh, detailed and uh, conscientious being programs for possible wild reintroduction down the line. And yet, why cross? Only zoo in the UK where you can see all four great apes you have in your in your exhibits there. But also a zoo that carries around some of the issues of the past with the, the chimpanzee adverts. Uh, most viewers may or may not know that some of the chimpanzees at Twycross were used regularly for very popular tea ads. PG Tips Tea is a very popular brand in the UK, and that was what the zoo often was known for in the 60s and 70s. You could see moved beyond that. But do you find you're still having to explain that particular piece of your history? I, d I don't mind having to explain it. It's how the world worked in the 50s and 60s, and I think you know we, we can put on you know present day goggles and judge, but um, would we do that now? Absolutely not. Are we aware of the damage it did to those chimps? Absolutely. Um, but what well, we're sitting here now in in 2016 saying that, and, and now you know we are passionate advocates of not using apes in the media like that, and not taking them from their parents, and not training them for media use, and not using them in adverts um, or, or TV productions. So we've learned our lessons there, and we need to try and make sure everyone else doesn't doesn't repeat those mistakes. It's a tragedy to still see it happening um, around the world at all. But you know that's how we started. I will, you know, I will take that on the chin. You know that is how we started. We would never do that again. And now we're dealing with the legacy of those chimps growing up and and, uh, and rewilding them, if you like, and, and putting them into more natural groups. The staff here are working super hard to do that. And a lot of zoos have that kind of shameful history. You know, I'm not denying it. But what we need to do now is look forward. We can all talk endlessly about the mistakes of the past, but what are we going to do now? to go forward to save great apes from extinction and I think that's the role of the modern zoo that needs to be discussed. We need to really step up and do things differently and um, stop crying about the past and that's been pulled back into that but what are we going to do from here to now and I think um, if, zoos, if zoos hadn't been invented yet, I mean certainly if we're operating like the 50s and 60s and 70s, yes we should all be shut. Um, but if zoos didn't exist now, we would probably reinvent a version of them to try and save the species. Great, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I'd like to turn now to Steve Unwin. Steve, you're somebody that I've worked so closely with for more than a decade, both in Africa and Asia, and you have given tremendous amounts of your time, much like Sharon Redrobe uh, does, to training. Uh, veterinarians, training managers, staffs at sanctuaries in Africa and Asia. All of that was contributed by the Chester Zoo and your own your own time as well. But I always noticed over the years that there was all more than one Chester Zoo staff coming with you. You had a tremendous uh, knock-on effect, I would say, or at least an ability to influence other staff members. Is that something that was unique to Chester Zoo, or does the Chester Zoo just have staff that wants to be engaged? Is that the way zoos perhaps should uh, capitalize on these opportunities? Uh, I don't think it's unique to Chester Zoo, um, but um, it's something that um, the way our conservation programs are focused in that, um, I think Neil mentioned it before, about social change. And me as a single person, or Chester Zoo as a single zoo, can do so much to um, uh, help conservation wherever we're doing. Um, but most of our programs, certainly with the Great Apes, um, that you would have seen uh, with the work with PASA and now with the Orangutan Veterinary Advisory Group and work we're doing in the field with Hutan in, in Malaysia, uh, is all about empowering and capacity building and succession change with, the, with people in country, which is basically what conservation NGOs do as well. Um, so We've had a good success um, in many different projects, including the, um, uh, the Great A work that we do, uh, with forming partnerships with NGOs in country, forming partnerships with universities and other learning institutions um, in range countries, uh, and assisting them to, um, uh, and assisting every, all, all of us to do conservation work better. So uh, with the orangutan, we use um, uh, start off with the orangutan veterinarians. Um, and back when we were starting with that, we were um, uh, assisting with training. 
Now, they are the ones who are training other people um, uh, in areas as diverse as um, biosecurity for um, disease transmission um, through to uh, human wildlife conflict and various forest situations. Um, and also looking at um, the issues of palm oil um, and how palm oil in relation to um, uh, Asia and now more and more in West Africa um, is uh, portrayed in those countries uh, and how that message is then forwarded to um, uh, the people who come in, uh, in, into the zoo. And that's a very important link, is to link what people who in a country here seeing when they come and visit us and making that link with what is going on um, uh, out in the field as well. And as far as, um, I've got one very specific um, example, um, the, our, uh, the um, uh, person in charge of our Africa program uh, grew up in Chester and um, uh, he, uh, the first, he, he became um, a conservationist working in Africa because of the gorillas that um, he had seen here at Chester Zoo back in the um, late 80s, early 90s. So that's one case that uh, may have worked, but, yeah. <laughs> but as I say, I can only talk for um, uh, the Chester Zoo and a little bit of the Yaza. Great, thanks. Well, now to turn to Deborah Luke at the ACA, and one of the newest members of, of the Grape Survival Partnership, welcome aboard, great. AZA is an interesting situation now. Uh, it's, it's member zoos, 229 zoos, I believe, comprise the AZA. Uh, gave about 4.5 million annually to gorilla conservation, for instance, in individual giving. The AZA itself has a, a giving program through the, the Grade 8 TAG, the Taxon Advisory Group, that distributes grants as well. But the AZA recently introduced a new program uh, called Saving Animals from Extinction, SAFE. And that is more of a, uh, a group effort through all of the zoos, and gorillas are one of the one of the species included in SAFE. I wonder if you could possibly explain a bit more that might sh perhaps change the paradigm for conservation with zoos. Absolutely, and thank you for inviting me to this. This is exciting to be part of GRASP, and we're very thrilled to be a part of it and with this prestigious group that you have, so thank you for uh, having us. Um, this is a great conversation. I'm really excited to be a part of it. Um, I think uh, SAFE is the next generation of conservation, at least from the AZA perspective, um, in working with our zoos and aquariums. We do have 233 accredited zoos and aquariums at this point. Um, it, we've grown in the last year. Um, and I want to also mention that I think it's it's really important, as Sharon mentioned, to say that we need to get beyond the past. We talk about um, you know, things that happened in the past in zoos and aquariums. Well, they've happened in the past everywhere. We can talk about human history and how we've treated our, our humans, and we still are in certain ways. We've evolved over time. And zoos and aquariums have done the same thing. So rather than talking about what we used to be, let's talk about where we are. And where we are and the reality of where we are is that we are already making huge contributions as an industry for conservation. Um, as you mentioned, uh, even last year we spent, our zoos and aquariums spent over $150 million in direct field conservation. That's just the 233 AZA accredited zoos. Um, for gorilla conservation, over $11 million in the last four years. That was our members. As you mentioned, the Ape Tag has spent, uh, has developed uh, their own conservation initiative where it's three year grant periods and they're funding eight different projects. And they're, they're not just funding them, but they're implementing them. Um, so money is an important part of conservation. There's no doubt about that. And I think, um, as Neil was talking about, I don't think we could do that if it wasn't a zoo or aquarium to bring that together. There's an, there's a, an incentive for people that come in to contribute to conservation when they connect to nature. And I think one of the important things with zoos and aquariums is that our research shows that when uh, people come to zoos and aquariums, they're doing it because of several reasons, but one of the primary ones is because it's a great family event. It's a great way for your family to share and it connects people to nature. It lets people see animals, smell animals, hear animals, see how they behave in ways that they probably wouldn't be able to do any other way in their lives. And when people see things that they wouldn't normally be able to, they can connect with them. And so zoos and aquariums play a very important role, not just to conservation, but connecting people. And if, if that doesn't really ring true to you, then consider the fact that there's more than 180 million visitors each year 
to AZA's 233 accredited zoos and aquariums. That's more than the attendance at all the sporting events combined. People are going to zoos and aquariums for reasons. And they're learning, they're learning, figuring out how to help save species. So that's a really important factor. I think also Sharon mentioned something that we also need to think about beyond the money. Money is very important. Every NGO out there needs money. There's no doubt about that to do conservation. But when you think about the community that's involved in zoos and aquariums, we have the greatest wealth of expertise when it comes to wild animal health care, management, and also engaging people and reaching people in the audiences. So when you put all that together, it's a massive amount of experiential and financial resources that have been continually contributed to animal conservation. But now what we're all realizing and we're seeing, um, the story with Grower's Gorilla is a perfect example. Despite our efforts, despite the efforts of all the NGOs that are out there trying to save not only the great apes but a, a plethora of animals out there, these animals are still declining and we need to do something different. And that's where SAFE comes in. So SAFE is an acronym for Saving Animals from Extinction. And what it does is it takes that experience that we've already uh, used to help save numerous species in the wild using the program. And we're combining it together in a collaborative approach, working with all the NGOs, everybody that we can possibly find that is already focusing on certain species. And there are 10 signature species that were selected, and gorilla is one of those. Uh, we're looking at all gorillas, but we're primarily focusing on growers and Cross River. And to bring either bring partners together that's been involved in conservation of these species or to uh, meet with those partners and have that group as a collaborative whole identify what the conservation actions are that are needed for that species. And then developing a conservation action plan where all of us are working together in a coordinated approach to increase our efficiency, increase our effectiveness to save that species. So it's the next step. Great. Uh, let me turn for a second to Neil. This is an interesting point, and it's been made by several of our, of our guests today, that the educational value of a zoo has the ability to convert visitors. What, how fine is that line, though, between explaining what palm oil is or explaining the crash of the population of growers and gorillas and somehow turning off the, pop, the, the public that comes to the zoo and, and you miss that opportunity. Is that, is that a difficult uh, equation to work out? Well, it, I mean, this is, this is one for the educationalists or the learning departments and you're absolutely right. It's, if it was easy, social change in any respect, it, we'd all be, you know, we're doing it not just in, in wildlife but in, in anything we see that we, need, we think could uh, help humanity. It is a real challenge, isn't it, when you have a situation that is clearly, you know, um, needs addressing like the loss of wildlife. We're, we all recognize that. How do we then engage people into to real meaning? And and the, our competition is is not just other good causes, but it's um, it, it's what people how people elect to, to choose to spend their lives. And, and Debbie was talking about there about this 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 idea about the family coming together and learning together. We we know is something that parents value in, in terms of giving their kids this good experience. Good parenting is is really important. So we've mentioned it quite a few times about this potential. How do we turn this potential into actuality? And it is not easy. I mean, what we're talking about doing is values. I mean, values in itself is, is just, we could do a whole webcast on that for probably for about a week. Um, how, about how do we get from this connection of you see an animal in an area and then try and use that in some way to get this, this value back to conservation of the species? And we're still working at it. Um, we, uh, Steve was mentioning there about Chester and the, the Palm Isle campaign. It's um, it's one they've put an awful lot of work into. How you know what does that translate into when people come and they learn about Palm Isle? Does that make a decision when they go and pick up a product? And the evidence says it yes, but it's going to take an awful long time. I've been in conservation for an awful long time in, in my life, and I remember many many years ago. Um, talking to a group of school kids in the UK about saving the whale and um, if I walked into and I was greeted then like who is this guy you know he's a, he's a complete freak um, I, if I went to a classroom now and said save the whale they said well of course we save the whale it's obvious and an awful lot of the protection that it's had for those particular uh, animals 
is a result of that engagement program supported by people like Greenpeace with their campaigns and people like Born Free who are doing the campaigns for, for saying look animals are really important. So I come back to what I said earlier about collaboration is that listen we have got the potential yes we're slowly but surely trying to translate this anything anybody who's got any insight into how to instigate for example behavioral change then let's listen to it. Let, let, let's look at it. But let's work together on it. Let's not uh, sling mud at each other. And this this conversation is not about that. Um, but we've got absolutely significant challenges to to make. Everybody's saying here these you know these amazing animals are going extinct. So let us try and do something. So my 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 on that particular one, yes, engagement. We know that it works. But let's let's try and in increase it. Thanks a lot, Neil. Appreciate that. Uh, Chris, let me ask you a question. There's, it's clear that money is, is important. Everybody needs money to operate field programs, and certainly Born Free, like everybody else, has to raise funds. There's an opportunity that zoos have to raise more funds. Perhaps never quite enough to get over the hump. Uh, clearly, uh, conservation costs a great deal, and if it was just a money issue, we might have figured it out by now. What, in your opinion, could or should zoos do differently, or perhaps bring to the table if they're not? that might be a value to the, bro the broader conservation picture. Thanks, Doug. I mean, what's in, in answer to your question, um, I found it very interesting that the discussion so far and, and what people have been saying, it's been, it's been refreshingly honest and um, has focused quite a lot on what you might class as mostly in situ conservation and extramural work. So the the fundraising that uh, Neil mentioned, for example, you know, that took place outside of the zoo using uh, fiberglass models of of gorillas, I believe it was. And and these are techniques that you know, born free has, has used ourselves quite successfully as well. What we're not talking about is the traditional zoo with animals on exhibit, uh, bringing in the visitors, and then and and that's is unfortunately what we're talking about when we're talking about zoos. The other stuff, the extramural stuff, the in-situ work is clearly of benefit and we're all doing that. We're all raising funds for conservation. The, the criticism I, I have to to zoos is, is not about the total amount of funds. It's, an, it's not just about money as we've already discussed. It's about the relative expense and that it's an inefficient model and I think there's some agreement there on that. Um, Yes, if, if responsible zoos are going to be claiming to operate as conservation NGOs, then they should be very much doing that. The, the trouble I have is the disconnect between doing potentially good work, as has been described in, in terms of in-situ work or stuff outside the captive facility, while still maintaining captive populations of animals and, and still in, insisting to visitors that these captive populations have a role to play in conservation. And I think there is the evidence there is what perhaps we need to look at in a bit more detail. Given the, well, let's be honest, the, the unlikely scenario of uh, successful reintroduction of great apes from captive facilities really in, in, a, in a global sense, um, you are dealing with trying to then offer the best welfare for these animals that are currently there and I, I know that there are efforts going on in that regard and we've got two veterinarians on the call on, on the, the webcast today but they will be more familiar than anybody with the specific health and welfare issues that come with maintaining ca uh, great apes in captivity the behavioral issues and and you know the, the health issues like the cardiac problems that have been uh, well described in, in certain species um, and, you, and yet these are the animals that people are coming to see apparently. So I, I do question this assumption that the educational engagement of exposing these animals to the public and the public learning something from seeing, uh, let's say, a, a chimp or a gorilla engaged in, in regurgitation and re-ingestion or something that is, is a, a fairly sort of abnormal behavior in a captive environment, what that is really doing for conservation. I, I'm, I'm with I'm with every, every point that's been made so far in terms of what needs to happen for conservation in the wild. That much I think we, we can all agree on. What, what I'm concerned about is the claims and the practices, the claims for conservation and the practice of, conserv uh, of, of, of keeping animals in captivity. Uh, and we're not really, um, we haven't quite tackled that one yet. Chris brings up a very good point that's actually in the news and very relevant right now. Just this past week, the United States government for the second time approved 
transport permits to move eight chimpanzees from the Yerkes Primate Research Center in the United States in Atlanta, Georgia, to a, a zoo in the UK, the Wingham Wildlife Park. Wingham Wildlife Park is not a member of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. It is a fairly small zoo, and the reason it is able to take these chimpanzees, at least so far, although there have been some motions to file lawsuits to stop the transfer from happening, is that this is going to somehow benefit the wild populations as part of a conservation effort by Wingham to sustain the, the, the chimpanzees over, over uh, in perpetuity in the wild. This is a bit of a stretch, I think, for most people, but if I could ask you, Sharon Redrobe, how easy is it to confuse the public or how easily is the public confused? with that line between what they're seeing in an exhibit and what's happening in the wild and, and how that relationship um, is made? Um, it's a good question and it's a, it's a, it's a massive question and I, that's why I said earlier I don't think we, we should, what we're not doing, what we, sh what we should be doing. Um, the vast majority of the visiting public do you actually like a good day out at the zoo? And that's something that zoos struggle with as well. We want to engage them with the real issues of the world. We want to engage them in even simple things such as recycling and be, being less of a consumer so we're not planting as much palm oil or digging up the mobile phones, etc. But to drive that behavior change, we need to access the numbers. And that's getting people in through the door so we can actually talk to them. And, and there's been lots of interesting science and, and, and research and looking at what people want to hear, what messages they take in, and if we're very negative, it turns people off. And that, that's, a, that's a, a constant challenge. I think part of your question perhaps relates to, you know, can we confuse, should we confuse? Uh, and to pick up on, on Chris's point about normally, in none of us, none of us looking after these animals would would defend poor welfare. That's about we shouldn't be doing it, it, it should be stopped. I, I think the fact that things are not perfect is not a reason to ban the whole thing or to or to um, criticize everybody for for uh, what I hope is a minority. So I don't think we have to we have to take the public with us. I think that you just heard from AZA in America, those numbers are extremely powerful. More people go through zoos, whether you like that or not, but more people go through zoos than go through um, sporting stadia. That is a massive opportunity to engage a huge chunk of the human population. But driving behavior change is extremely hard. And I think we can't justify keeping animals in captivity because we're using them to make money. That is ridiculous. Um, as you've already heard, it's not a great funding model, but that's not what we're doing it for. Um, we, we are keeping the animals um, in managed programs that are part of either AZA or or EASA, um, genetically um, on the planet, and that is what we should have been doing years ago, but now we are doing that. So we are no longer part of the no longer net users of wildlife, and that's been a matter of 30 years. Great. We now need to be part of the solution, and how we're going to do that? Is it educating the public? Is it working with our with our colleagues? That's not just by giving money, but as we always say, about skill share and capacity building, and it's actually all of those things. That's what we can do. That's what the great zoos can do. That's what we all need to be doing. It's not yet enshrined in legislation. We're doing that because the zoo community, with initiatives like SAFE and, and others, to do off their own bat. So we are driving change. We are improving. We are doing some great. I think sometimes our marketing departments don't want to sell it because it doesn't encourage a zoo visit and a day out. And there's that there's that challenge with whether you sell the fun day out and get the messages in when they're on site. And how do we explain that? a wider audience. But, but I applaud the push for animal welfare to be improved all the time. I have to justify why you've got animals in captivity in the middle of England. And I'm very happy with that moving forward. But I'm not comfortable with, with shut all zooms because we're not doing um, any good. I think the world's changed a lot. We were net problems um, in the 50s and 60s, but we are now part of the solution very much so. 
Great. Thank you, Sharon. Let me ask you a question now, Steve. In terms of your personal commitment, it is, it is it's clear, again, I've known you for quite some time, and, and the amount of time and energy and resources you donate to conservation on behalf of Chester Zoo is almost un, incalculable. What would happen if you were to leave? Is the, does the zoo, has it taken this on so that Chester is part of the foundation of conservation in Africa and Asia, or does it leave with you? And, and on top of that, what difference does it make, in your opinion, to those programs you work with on the ground? Um, the short answer is um, it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. It would just see a different face on your screen. Um, and I think that's a really important place that I'll be doing what I was doing somewhere else. Um, but, and that's what I was talking a bit about before, trying to get on the idea of succession planning, is that the field work we do, um, certainly um, we got a wee way there in Africa, but we're certainly miles ahead in Indonesia and Malaysia, that if I was run over by the proverbial bus next week and didn't make it to Malaysia in July when I'm going, things would still rumble on and they would continue to get better. I'm becoming more and more superfluous, which is kind of the idea. And the same is, goes for being um, uh, working in um, a center like Chester Zoo, in that uh, I'm surrounded by dozens of people who um, uh, are doing just as much, if not more, than me on an individual and an institutional basis in conservation. Veterinary-wise, yeah, there's um, uh, somebody else would, would step into the breach. Um, as well, so and and that's really important. It can't be individual person focused. You have to, it's um, much more of a collaboration. And I want to pick up what uh, Sharon said as well, which is very important: is that zoos are no longer a net user of wildlife. And I do occasionally get um, concerned or a little bit frustrated um, when sort of internationally we um, talk a lot about conservation, but not so much about the welfare. Um, uh, within zoos as part of a, of a, of a marketing thing, uh, a marketing program. I think that's just as important. I consider zoos need to be, and many of us are, good and excel at both welfare and conservation. And um, uh, to have, a, uh, as far as uh, responding back to Chris, as well as to why these particular species or individuals are within collections as um, uh, as has already been said, they're a part of interna uh, international breeding programs through IASA or, or, or whomever. But also for those animals that are not part of breeding programs, having a very clear reasoning within collection plans as to why they are there. They are not there to bring people in and raise money. And speaking for Chester Zoo, we do have a collection plan that's publicly available. Uh, and we do have species and individuals on that collection plan that um, uh, do not have a particular purpose, be it education or conservation or whatever, but we have a responsibility to those animals to um, look after their um, uh, and look after their welfare and um, uh, throughout their lives. Great, thanks, Steve. I'd like to just clarify a point. That it's not confusing for any of the audience watching. Certainly, reintroduction programs from rehabilitation centers and sanctuaries in Africa and Asia elsewhere, but for great apes in Africa and Asia. Those have proven uh, quite successful in terms of survival rates, in terms of reproduction. The actual total numbers put back in the wild are still fairly small, but very high survival rates. It's important to point out that very few zoos, uh, in terms of great apes, have done reintroduction or attempted reintroduction. So that is a step further away. The, the Howlett's and Aspinall Foundation in the UK is probably the most advanced in that and has had mixed success in bringing apes from, from the UK to uh, Central Africa. Uh, it's certainly an area for growth and possibility, but it's not something that is done on a regular basis right now. We have about 10 minutes or less of this webcast left. I'd like to wrap up now, but I'd like to ask each one of the guests if they could. Um, this is about modern zoos and great ape conservation, and clearly there's, a, there's some pathways here. There's some synergies. There's a lot of collaboration. A lot of the, the, the remnants of the past are left in the past now. But is there something more that needs to be done? Is there something that zoos are not able to deliver or uh, should be delivering on that could make the difference? Is there something that's that's beyond the reach right now? I'll start with uh, with uh, you, Deborah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that's part of the evolution. I, I hope that as we continue on throughout life, we're still growing no matter where we go. So I think, yes, there's always going to be something more to do. Um, when we talk about 
are zoos conservation organizations? Zoos and aquariums are zoos and aquariums. Their purpose is to be zoos and aquariums. There's no doubt about that. But all of our accredited zoos and aquariums, as well as WAZA, uh, zoos and aquariums, and IAZA, regional uh, aquariums and zoos, their missions are based on the animals, on conservation of the animals. So they are zoos and aquariums, but their education programs, their research programs, their conservation programs, all things that are required to be accredited are based on animal conservation. So it's a matter of semantics, but it's an important factor I think we need to realize. Um, and they have an audience where we can tap into and engage and educate the public on issues that are affecting the animals that they see, as well as animals that might not be in in their walls that they're not caring for, that they're still promoting and talking about, such as the vaquita, if you will, um, which is a huge conservation issue right now. So they, zoos and aquariums play a very, very important conservation role. And I don't want to get caught up in the semantics of are they exactly in a conservation NGO. Their whole basis is based on animals and conservation. Um, but where we go in the future, you mentioned SAFE, and I, I talked a little bit about SAFE, but there are two facets of SAFE. One is the actual field conservation, conservation of the species in the wild, but the other side of that is that public engagement factor that we were just talking about. Um, it is very difficult, as everybody mentioned, to measure social change, whether it be the, the lung association talking about stopping smoking. Um, all the way to animal conservation. It's very difficult to measure what an impact is of a visit to a zoo or aquarium or multiple visits or education programs. And it takes a longitudinal study of massive proportions to show that. Um, and do I believe that we're making impacts? Absolutely. The example about the whales is a great example. Example about the tuna industry and certain things that have happened over time are fantastic examples. SAFE is as I said, those twofold um, areas of focus, and public engagement is one of those. And the goal behind that is to go to that next step, that evolution, which is to utilize all of our institutions that are accredited by us, as well as our partners and our partner institutions and other regional associations to work in a coordinated, collaborative approach to engage and educate the public. Now, this is a different step because all of our institutions work on education and engagement but they do so much like the NGOs for conservation do they work in their silos if you will there's an area of focus there's an area of discussion and really in-depth focus but it hits one portion of the population it hits one area of focus safe is taking all of that and putting it together and working to develop the messaging the asks of the public the ask for policy change and move that forward in a coordinated and effective approach. And it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. We've had several um, multi-day meetings, bringing in lots of people who talk about social change and what it takes. Um, and we're moving forward on it, but we want to make sure we do it right. And we want to make sure we tap into all the expertise within our community and all of, all of our partners and other NGOs out there to make sure that we're really focusing on the best things that we can. So it's a really exciting um, potential focus that we're moving forward on in actually a very short period of time. Um, and all of that is going to be based on being able to measure our outputs, being able to measure what we're doing so that we can demonstrate, yes, we are making a difference. Great, thanks. Let's turn to you now, Neil. What would you like to see uh, zoos do in terms of, of great ape conservation that they're not doing, perhaps? Well, I mean, there's been some great points made by the others as well. I think. Um, if I was to say to, to Chris, I absolutely understand where you're coming from in terms of, um, uh, it's you know the proportion. I think we we've got to look to encourage more zoos to give more um, uh, measurable support to great ape conservation. There is one thing also uh, that we we've, we've we've implied but we haven't stated yet that there is a massive difference between a good zoo and a bad zoo, um, and actually the word zoo is used in a fairly you know, broadest sense. Um, you know there are rescue centers in Africa and India who are called zoos, but their their role is a rescue center. They have to accept confiscated animals, etc., and have some program of reintroduction. So, the word zoo is is quite difficult. I would certainly like to see the leading zoos, um, of which you know we've got some represented here, but there are the great zoos working with uh, within the sort of the zoo sector to.
try and encourage and, and showcase what a zoo can do and reach those bad zoos. And, and that's what it doesn't, it doesn't matter which part of the world. Um, but I would say that the, the standards in, in some of the other parts of the world need improving. I mean, you know, looking straight forward at a, a commercial enterprise. Well, you know, zoos as a commercial enterprise isn't something I, I, I favour, you know, it's, just, it's as simple as that, I, purely commercial. So I think there's a role for the good zoos to support the worst zoos and bring them up so they make a greater contribution. And great apes is, if we can't have a great apes, then we can't do anything. Great, thank you. Let me try it now with you, Chris. What would you have as a suggestion for the, the role zoos might play? <coughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, Doug, and thanks to the, the previous um, couple of, of comments, actually. Um, particularly Neil's point just then, which I'll touch on in just a second. Um, but in answer to your question, Doug, the thing that zoos need to do, in my opinion, is ask themselves some really tough and critical questions. Um, cut through the, the hyperbole and the, you know, the, the bluster that seems to be prevalent in relation to their potential for a role in conservation and actually look at these measurable outcomes, what are zoos doing for conservation, what are they genuinely capable of doing for conservation, what species can compassionately and humanely be kept in current zoo conditions. They ask themselves some, some tough questions and, if, and, and make some tough decisions and, and take some, I would hope, some, some sort of robust action internally to, to look at their own ability to deliver on their claims. Um, so that's the sort of the general premise that I, I'd, I'd like to see zoos take. Uh, Neil's point about um, good zoos versus bad zoos, it's not a term I, I, I that sits that easily with me because it always comes down to the enclosure level. It's never, it's never you know, it, there's no such thing as a good zoo. There are some zoos with more better enclosures than others. Um, what I would say, that it, to pick up on what Neil said, though, is, is this sort of outreach, this sort of... Um, taking action against poor quality zoos, some of whom I have to point out are members of these the, the, uh, the, the broader regional and global affiliations in some cases, I, I would like to see more concrete action taken by the, the zoos wanting to be responsible against those, uh, those zoos that are failing, genuinely failing. And, and I would also ask that perhaps it isn't always a case of just shoring them up and getting them up to standard and that in some cases certain zoos will never meet standard and they should be closed. They should, what action should be, a strategic plan should be put in place to help those zoos close, not always resurrect them from, from the doldrums because sometimes it just isn't possible. Um, and finally just you know on a, on a more hopefully more positive note there are areas where organizations like Born Free would are happy to work with with more responsible zoos and and um, the the industry more generally. For example, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, the use of great apes in entertainment um, is a real real issue. Where I hope that both sides of, of the sort of zoo debate um, can come together and and work collaboratively collaboratively on that sort of thing, and really try and get the educational messaging out there. And, and put aside, you know, because it's something that sits outside of zoos, outside of the NGO world, it's something that is a problem. And it is obviously contributing to a, a public perception of how these animals should be kept. And, and in, in some cases, um, encouraging a trade in them in certain regions. So um, there is there's certainly uh, a lot of room for, for communication and perhaps some collaboration moving forward. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Of course, you are collaborating through the Great Apes Survival Partnership, so we've already moved at least one step forward. Uh, Steve, let me go to you now. Uh, yeah, um, there's uh, two things I wanted to uh, sort of pick up. Um, firstly, on uh, it's a I believe it's part of the WASA strategy that for um, zoos to be able to assist in, um, so to say, with Great Apes and Range Country zoos to improve their practices within the zoo community. Uh, and I think that's something we can definitely um, uh, be doing better. But the other thing that Chris mentioned was uh, is evaluating our conservation impact, which uh, is something I think everybody struggles with. How the hell do you do it, both quantitatively and qualitatively? And uh, again, initially through WASA, um, we helped develop a, a semi-quantitative uh, program for any sort of organization to look at that uh, and how, how you can potentially start to put measurements on whether what sort of positive or negative impact you're having on the conservation work you're doing. 
we're refining that all the time. Um, uh, we've employed a conservation impact officer to make sure that the work that um, Chester Zoo is involved in, both in the UK and internationally, uh, is uh, evaluated and having the best possible impact it could be. And I think in those sorts of areas to prove to ourselves as well as people outside zoos, whether you're using Maradi or whatever sort of um, op open um, uh, access um, uh, materials or, or whatever to look at and at least start to move down the way, down the path of proof that what you are doing in conservation is actually having a positive impact. And I think zoos can do that, in all NGOs can do that. Yeah. Thank you, that's certainly a good point. That's something we all struggle with is where is the bar and how we raised it. Sharon, let me conclude with you. What, what should or could zoos be doing differently that might change the paradigm for great ape conservation? Yeah, I think I think change the paradigm is what is what I was going to say. I think we can continue to justify what we currently do and we can measure it better perhaps, but I think we really need to raise the bar and and, and, and have a whole paradigm shift. Um, the world the world is too small and the extinction crisis is happening too fast for us to continue in our different silos. I really want all of us that are passionate about great apes and the rest of the beasts but to focus on great apes with grass. Let's focus on passion on making a difference together. We've all got different resources to bring, we've all got different skill sets, we've all been approaching this from a slightly different angle, but surely there is still time left, hopefully, for us to get all around the table and break down some of those barriers and put together. I think we have to, and I'll speak to Zoom and, um, uh, you know, fly across the world, let's put our reasons and, and stop looking about what Zoo can do and what it can get a medal for. If this is about great ape survival, which partners do we need to work? Is that money? Is that people support? And very importantly, political support and getting whole country um, and political engagement because that um, in the next 15, 20 years, not us all bigging ourselves up individually and trying to fight our own corners. I think the GRASP initi initiative is really exciting. It's you know it's 15 years old now. What does the next 15 look like? And I, I applaud the fact you've managed to get us all on the same course. <laughs> that was easy. Slightly differently, but that's the problem, but we need to start doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you to all of our guests today. Uh, we, we've talked in this in this call about some of the, the numbers, the population is being so low of great apes. There's 3,800 Browers gorillas left in eastern DR Congo, 300 Cross River gorillas left in uh, in Nigeria Cameroon area, maybe 14,000 Sumatran orangutans. I am hopeful, and I hope I believe all the guests today share the hope that we can find positive ways to change that, that those declining numbers when it's not born of crisis, when we can use our heads and our intelligence and these partnerships to move forward. I'd like to thank Chris Draper of the Born Free Foundation, Deborah Luke of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, Neil Madison of the Bristol Zoo Society, Sharon Redrobe of the Twycross Zoo, and Steve Unwin of the Chester Zoo for joining us today to talk on the, great, the GRASP webcast about modern zoos and great ape conservation. I'd like to invite everybody to join us again in a few weeks when the United Nations Environment Assembly will be uh, held here in Nairobi and we'll have a number of live webcasts and uh, drop in interviews during that with leading change makers, stakeholders, policy makers, uh, ministers, and heads of state here uh, to discuss issues of environment. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Goodbye. <laughs>